USGS topographic quadrangles are maps produced by the U.S. Geological Survey. They can be accessed in digital or paper form. For purposes of this video tutorial, I'll be using this digital version of the Pyramid Peak topographic quadrangle. Pyramid Peak is in the Desolation Wilderness in California. The borders of USGS quadrangles are latitude and longitude lines. We can identify the value of those lines by studying the corners of the quadrangle. Here, in the top left corner, we see a vertical longitude line and a horizontal latitude line, and their corresponding measurements, identified from the mess of numbers that exist here by their location and their units, degrees, minutes, and seconds. The rest of these numbers are part of a national grid or state plane coordinate system. We are not going to discuss or use those numbers in this video tutorial. That means we have to ignore most of these numbers and focus only on those that are latitudes and longitudes. How do we find them? Look for the numbers with minutes and seconds as their unit. Back to the left corner. The latitude line moves across the top, so we should find the same latitude measurement on both top corners, 38 degrees, 52 minutes, 30 seconds. Of course, all latitude lines must also have a direction, north or south of the equator. So let's look at the bottom corners to help us determine direction for this quadrangle. Down here in the lower right and lower left, we see the bottom latitude, 38 degrees, 45 minutes, 0 seconds. The map doesn't provide us direction or even include seconds when those are equal to 0 because the map makers felt the reader could understand for themselves these abbreviations and fill in the missing information. Abbreviations reduce the amount of text required to be on the map, but we're going to fill in those abbreviations for our records to ensure our information is complete. Notice that the latitude numbers get larger as we move north. That is true only if we are north of the equator. So we can add the letter N after all these latitude lines. Now let's look at the longitude borders. Here on the top right corner, at the top above this vertical border, we find the number 120 degrees 7 minutes 30 seconds, which matches the number that sits below the line in the bottom right corner. Is it west or east of the prime meridian? Let's look at the left side of the map. Here we see the number 120 degrees 15 minutes 0 seconds. Since these numbers grow larger as we move westward, we must be west of the prime meridian, so we add W, or west, to each of our border numbers. Comparing the two latitude borders with each other, we see that there are a total of 7 minutes and 30 seconds of latitude covered by this map. 45 minutes plus 7 minutes and 30 seconds equals 52 minutes and 30 seconds. And there are also 7 minutes and 30 seconds of longitude. 7 minutes and 30 seconds plus 7 minutes and 30 seconds equals 15 minutes. So there are equal angles of measurement for all sides. That makes this map a 7 minute 30 second or 7 and a half minute quadrangle. Though we can see that the map is not square shaped. Equal angles are not the same as equal distances. The width and height are not identical distances, just identical angles. Remember, Latitude lines are parallel and cover roughly the same distance between them regardless of where they are on the planet. In other words, a seven and a half minute quadrangle will always be this tall. However, longitude lines converge as they approach the poles, so a seven and a half minute quadrangle will get narrower and narrower the further north or south of the equator we get. That just means this quadrangle covers and displays less terrain widthwise than it does heightwise. Now let's look at the rest of the borders of the map. Somewhere in there amongst all these extra grid system numbers are subdivisions of the latitude and longitude. Here we can see an abbreviated latitude, 47 minutes 30 seconds, that is matched on the opposite side of the map. That tells us it's the latitude line, 38 degrees 47 minutes 30 seconds north. Continuing up, we find a measurement that says 50 minutes, meaning 38 degrees 50 minutes 0 seconds north. So now we can see four latitude lines breaking up the quadrangle into a grid system. Similarly, there are four longitude lines with subdivisions of 120 degrees 10 minutes 0 seconds west and 120 degrees 12 minutes 30 seconds west. So we could estimate the latitude and longitude of any location on this map by estimating where it sits between these grid lines and adding the appropriate error. Example, this star here is in the middle of these grid lines. 
The grid lines themselves are separated by two and a half minutes, half of which is one minute and 15 seconds. So if we add one minute and 15 seconds to this longitude and to this latitude, we will find the latitude and longitude of this point in the middle. I'll also add 15 seconds of error to handle the fact that it's an estimation. Now let's study the rest of the map. Here in the top right corner, we find the name of the map, and we see it identified as being part of a seven and a half minute series. Our measurements of the latitude and longitude borders confirm that. We also see this other name in parentheses going off at an angle. That is the name of the seven and a half minute quadrangle that would cover the terrain that meets this quadrangle at that corner. All the edges and corners of this map will have names of the adjoining maps. Let's move to the bottom center of the map to see another example. The quadrangle that would adjoin this map to the south is called Tragedy Springs. Also notice under the map here we see three scale bars, one for miles, one for feet, and one for kilometers. Notice that for each scale bar the zero is not on the left side but somewhere in the middle. Let's look more closely at the kilometer scale bar. The zero is in the center, and we have one kilometer measured on the right, and one kilometer measured on the left, but with 0.1 kilometer subdivisions. How do we use these scale bars? Let's zoom out again and imagine we have two locations we want to measure the distance between. We can lay down a piece of paper between those two locations on our map or on our screen if we're on a computer, and make tick marks on our paper to represent that length. Then we move the paper down to the scale bar, and lay the left tick mark on the zero, and look across to the right. We'll tick off the first kilometer here and then move the paper along the scale bar, ticking off another kilometer at a time until we find ourselves with less than a kilometer left. For this example, we have two full kilometers and one partial. Now we move the remainder of our line over to the left, line it up with the zero to determine how many tenths of a kilometer we have left. In this case, it looks like 0 0.85 kilometers. So we add them all up for our final distance measurement and add in the appropriate error. That error comes from a combination of the user and the method that we used. In this case, I feel confident my measurement is within 0 0.1 kilometers. What else can be seen down here at the bottom of the map? These arrows here tell us the magnetic declination at this location when the map was made. The star in this case points true north. GN is grid north, related to the numbers of the grid system we're ignoring, so we'll ignore this as well. The MN refers to magnetic north, the direction magnets pointed in this location in 1994 when this map was made. The angle between those two, from true north to magnetic north, is a bearing or an orientation. An oceanographer would write it simply as 15.5 degrees, meaning 15.5 degrees clockwise from north. A geologist would write it as north 15 degrees east, meaning start facing north and then rotate 15 degrees to the east. Now let's return to the scale bar. Just underneath we can read the contour interval for this map, 40 feet. What does that mean? Notice that throughout the map itself we find brown lines. These lines connect points of equal elevation above sea level and are called contour lines. Each one is 40 feet higher or lower than the one next to it and the numbers get higher as we move up peaks. Other maps called nautical charts have lines called isobaths that connect points of equal depth below sea level, and in that case the numbers get bigger as we go deeper under sea level. Let's look at another example. Here is an exaggerated terrain model showing peaks and valleys and lines of equal elevation. The corresponding map looks like this. Notice the contour interval noted at the bottom is 20 feet. Here's what the same map would look like if the lines were isobaths instead, and the terrain were underwater. For contour lines, the numbers get bigger as we move up the peak, but for the nautical chart underwater, the numbers get smaller because we're moving closer to sea level. Now let's return to the Pyramid Peak Quadrangle, which is above sea level, so we'll call the lines contours, and they get bigger as we move up. Zooming into the upper right of this quadrangle, we find Pyramid Peak, the mountain that gives this quadrangle its name. Notice that the contour lines come in two types, a light brown and a dark brown. 
Each contour line is separated by 40 feet, but the dark brown lines appear after every fifth contour, and thus group the contour lines into 200 feet sections. These darker lines are called index contours, and they should have a number marked along them somewhere, making it easier for us to tell their elevation. For example, moving up this valley here on the left, we find a 7600 contour line, then 7800, then 8000, then what we know must be 8200, 8400, 8600, and then no more index contours, but four more regular contours before we reach the peak of Blue Mountain. The black number written across the contour lines near the peak is the measured value or benchmark of the highest point on the peak. Notice that each of these peaks has an X marked at the highest spot and a number indicating the peak height. Measured benchmarks will appear at other locations as well, such as here at the spillway to Lake Aloha, noted at the time this map was made to be 8,116 feet above sea level. Whether an isobath or a contour line, remember that only the points on the line have that exact value for elevation or depth. Either side of the line will be greater or smaller. As we get comfortable reading contour lines or isobaths and recognizing shapes of hills and canyons, one useful tool for visualizing the relief in an area is to draw a topographic or bathymetric profile. These are especially useful if we plan to hike in an area and want to know how steep the slopes are. I'll demonstrate using this simple topographic map here that shows a hill that gets taller and reaches a peak. The contour interval is 20 feet, so this is 400 feet, and this line is 520 feet. And everything inside this circle would be higher than 520, but less than 540 feet. First step in building a profile is to draw a profile line on my map. I draw my line so it cuts across the peak and right through the two different types of hills. Second step, on a piece of graph paper, I draw a y-axis to represent the elevations I'll be drawing. In this case, the smallest would be 400 feet and the highest would be 540 feet. Notice that each division is equally separated by 20 feet. I could also draw it so each division was separated by 40 feet, or 10 feet, or 100 feet, whatever you choose. Just be consistent in each of your subdivisions. Next, I lay the graph paper down along the cross-section line. Everywhere a contour line intersects the cross-section line, I note the elevation and transfer that to my profile. This spot is 400 feet. This spot is 500 feet. Once I have all of my elevations transferred, I connect the dots with a smooth line. What do I do at the peak? I continue as best I can the two slopes on either side and smooth them to a peak that sits between 520 and 540 feet. And now I can see the differences in slopes between the west and east sides of this hill. Final step is to tell my audience how much I exaggerated this topographic profile, since the scale for the x-axis is not the same as that for the y-axis. What we've done is taken something that would look a lot flatter in reality and we've stretched it out vertically so that we can exaggerate and see more closely the differences. Now we have to tell our audience how much we did that. I take this scale for the x-axis, which is 0 0.25 miles or 1320 feet, and I lay that same length down on my y-axis. On the y-axis it equals 100 feet. 1,320 feet per line unit on the x-axis, and 100 feet per line unit on the y-axis. The y-axis is vertically exaggerated 1,320 divided by 100, or 13.2 times. Note, that's probably too precise a calculation, because the 100-foot measurement that I noted likely had an error of plus or minus 5 feet. So if I run that calculation, 1,320 divided by 95, and 1,320 divided by 105, I learned that I can safely round my number to 13. So the vertical exaggeration is 13 times. We use topographic or bathymetric profiles to exaggerate the terrain and better see the slopes and shapes above or below sea level so that we can turn our two-dimensional maps into more three-dimensional renderings. Mm -hmm.